Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining me on this mandatory session, but I'm very glad you're here and learning about gender affirming care. Um, we just had that wonderful talk by Dr. Wright on uh, gender affirming care for folks who are wanting estrogen therapy and um, androgen blockers. And I'm gonna talk about testosterone therapy now. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Lauren Campbell. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I'm an internal medicine primary care provider at the Seattle VA um, and also co-director of our gender diversity clinic. Hopefully I get to work with, or I have worked with a lot of you, but hopefully I get to work with even more um, folks going forward, anyone who wants to rotate um, and work with veterans receiving gender affirming care, I'm happy to work with you and them as well. Um, I do wanna acknowledge that I get a a lot of my training um, from my prior job, which was at Fenway Health, um, an LGBT health center out of Boston, Massachusetts, where the majority of our care was in gender affirming care. And we write some of the national guidelines and give a presentation with Harvard Medical School every year um, on those updated guidelines and recommendations. So that's been a majority of my practice. And I also pull information clearly from WPATH, which is the World Professional Association for Transgender Health um, and UCSF's uh, transgender health guidelines as well. Um, so today I wanted to spend about 45 minutes mostly going through cases um, for folks on trans or on testosterone therapy, um, just talking about some of the different scenarios that I might see, commonly see, um, so that you can take this knowledge into the world. I will tell you, not many internists out there know a lot of this. Um, so you are actually going to be ambassadors for this information in your jobs, wherever that leads you. Um, and so I'm really glad you're learning this. And uh, I would also say, feel free even after this presentation, even after you leave residency to reach out because these questions will continue to come up, whoever you're seeing in whatever roles um, you end up. Um, I do not have any financial disclosures, but I do need to acknowledge that there are no current FDA approved medications for gender affirming hormone therapy. So everything I will be discussing is currently off label. And then goals, really, we're gonna go over some cases. Um, if we have time at the end, I'll go through like the full informed consent for testosterone therapy. I don't think we'll end up having time for that, um, but it is available <laughs> if we get to that point or we're running, um, we're running short on time for some reason, or I guess long. Um, Basic terminology, there's a difference between sex, gender identity, and gender expression. Our sex is um, what we're assigned at birth, you know, which generally is male, female, or intersex. And people generally just decide this based on genitalia, which is not as we think about sex, which is actually the combination of genetics, um, our sex steroids, and our internal reproductive structures. So um, not everyone is labeled in terms of their sex, uh, how you would actually think about it if you did kind of more more looking into it. Um, however, that's how we end up with the sex marker. Um, and that's different than our gender identity, um, which is our internal sense of our gender. Um, and that's different than maybe how we express our gender in terms of our behavior, our mannerisms, our speech, and our dress. So just helpful to kind of break it down as there are a number of um, ways we wanna think about and distinguish um, how we think about gender and sex. I like the lovely gender unicorn as a good representation of this, but you've all seen this before. And then I know Dr. Wright briefly touched on this, but there are just, there are a huge spectrum of gender identities. There's no one right way to be in your gender. There's no one way you have to be in your gender your entire life. This can change over time. It's important to keep asking your patients not to just assume um, or to assume, uh, or sorry, to, to talk about it once and then never talk about it again, because um, it can change. And so just kind of, this is a representation of a, a number of different gender identities. And then in terms of how we affirm ourselves, of course, there's a number of ways to do that. Um, socially, you know, use people's actual names, the names they wanna be called, not necessarily the names in their chart. It's important to ask. It's important to provide your name that you actually use. It's also important to ask and provide your pronouns um, to be inclusive of all folks. There's ways that we can medically help affirm people. So we'll be talking about that today in terms of hormones, hair removal, voice therapy, prosthetics, all sorts of different things. And then we wanna also help people legally um, affirm themselves um, if there's any paperwork they might need in terms of identity documents. Um, and then also in whatever spaces you end up making sure there are inclusive policies and advocating for those. All right, so cases. I'm gonna go over hopefully about five different cases today. And I, my goal is that we're gonna go over a case we're gonna do a breakout room 
three to four folks talking about that case, talking about their ideas of what they may be able to offer, what questions they might have, come back together as a team, and then go over um, some recommendations, some things that we could offer this person. So a little bit more interactive. <laughs> Hopefully folks are online and, and able to participate as well. So case number one, this is Skylar. Um, Skylar is a 34-year-old assigned female at birth, or AFAB, gender queer veteran who's on injectable testosterone therapy and has been for the past two to three years. They're ingesting pretty high doses of testosterone, um, so 150 milligrams every week. And they've been having significant body and facial hair growth, subcutaneous tissue changes, voice changes, and clitoral development. They do report that they'd been on testosterone in the topical or gel formulation in the past, but at the time had experienced some breakthrough bleeding or spotting due to poor absorption and low levels of the testosterone. And this was really, really dysphoric for them. Um, they do not like having any bleeding. And when you talk to them a little bit further, they say, really, the only reason I'm on these higher levels of testosterone is to stop the bleeding. Testosterone is really important for me, but the lower levels would feel more affirming. So, I want to do a little breakout, um, see what people's thoughts are, what other questions might you have for Skylar, and what are their options. And unfortunately, <laughs> I don't, I don't, you're not going to have the case in front of you on those uh, um, breakout rooms. So just kind of thinking about this gender queer individual on high dose injectable estrogen, really wanting some of the testosterone effects, but really worried about um, having breakthrough bleeding, um, or they to be on a lower level. And then we'll come back together in about two minutes. Back. Um, I think most people are here, hopefully. Um, thank you so much for participating. I, I know it's hard to talk into a big group. Um, does anyone want to throw out there some things they, they spoke about as options? I know, big question. And if not, that's okay. We wondered um, about um, an IUD and awesome. balancing that with the potential dysphoria of having an IUD in place versus um, decreasing spotting. Awesome. I love it. That is a great idea. And we'll talk more about it. All right. I will move on. Um, all right. So. Oh, there's one more, oh. yeah, one more thing in the oh. chat that I'll just add. Um, you talked about challenges with other methods of controlling menstruation, mm -hmm. containing feminizing hormones, or requiring an invasive procedure. Awesome. Thank you so much, Priyanka. Um, and the other question I have is evaluating AUV. I feel like we forget about this. Thank you, Becca. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so thinking about Skylar. So our 34-year-old. Um, assigned female at birth, gender queer veteran on high dose testosterone that's injectable to prevent bleeding cycles. Um, you know, I think I would wanna start just exploring their gender goals as we all would, you know, what feels dysphoric for them in an ideal world, kind of how would they want their body to feel and be? Um, and what about being on higher dose testosterone don't they like? Um, is it the hair growth? You know, is it some of the subcutaneous tissue changes? Are there things they were hoping for more or less? And just having a discussion of that is, is really helpful to frame kind of where they might wanna go with their, with their um, gender affirming hormone therapy as well as other options for them. In this person, we might wanna check a testosterone level. Sometimes it can be helpful to guide. Mostly we check labs for safety reasons. We don't want it to be super, super therapeutic or conversely, really, really low. Like no, having no sex hormones can be risky if you talk about long-term risks like bone health. Um, so generally cis male level or somewhere in between the cis male and cis female level um, is a healthy range. Uh, for this veteran with really high dose testosterone, if their levels are actually super therapeutic, so above 800, um, they might actually end up at some point starting to aromatize that, that testosterone back into estrogen and can get bleeding for that reason. So in folks who are on really do high dose testosterone, I might check that level just to see, um, is it possible that the testosterone itself is
Well, yeah, I think, uh, I think Dr. Kim, I think your video may have, uh, have frozen. Uh, we'll those, do some. Those levels, they can vary how much they're using. Um, but it seems like at those lower levels, they'd had bleeding. And so in that case, we might want to offer them something else to help control the bleeding. Um, often that is a contraceptive. I'm going to talk a little bit about those different options and their effect as well in the next slides. Uh, because we have a number of different contraceptive options, all can be quite effective in terms of controlling bleeding. And so really we want to decide with the person, you know, which one might feel most easy for them to use, uh, might be most effective for their body. I will give them the, the low dose hormone therapy of a contraceptive does not counter that effect in any way. And so it's not something where I'd expect them to be experiencing changes that are like anti T in the other direction um, because of being on that contraceptive. And then for some folks, it's also considering like, is this something where they might want something like a hysterectomy? Have they, is that something within their goals? And talking more about that as well. Um, I, you know, Dr. Ellis was bringing up the question of if this is uh, abnormal bleeding, um, and I'll go over a little bit um, information on that as well. So, um, okay, oh, click. all right. Um, so I, I know this table. You kind of probably want to zoom in on it if you're on a smaller screen. Um, it was developed by the wonderful Dr. Frances Grimstad, um, who's a gynecologist at Boston Children's Hospital, as part of a presentation on the assessment and management of genital bleeding in transmasculine and non-binary folks with malarian structures. So malarian structures are our uter the uterus, ovaries, um, fallopian tube structures. And it compares the rates of amenorrhea in cis women after one year on contraceptives and kind of goes over the different contraceptive options. Um, so if you're looking up here, see so we've got our rate of amenorrhea that between somewhere in the 88% possibly um, down to much lower levels for certain options. And then the different type of contraceptive options. Overall, when I talk about this with folks, you know, I tell them there's not one right answer. It's really figuring out what feels right for your body. Um, there's no real good research on the superiority of any one therapy to manage continued bleeding on testosterone over the other. Um, and the preliminary data on abnormal bleeding beyond one year on testosterone does show that about 25% of people will experience one or more episode of bleeding on testosterone. Um, so that's not just a, like this is a pretty common thing to experience. So it's not something where I would necessarily do a workup for abnormal uterine bleeding in somebody who has an experience of, of bleeding. Although if there was something they were getting to experience much heavier bleeding over time or something else was going on, we might want to consider that workup. Um, and there was not really a great predictor of if somebody's on progesterone versus estrogen, progesterone versus testosterone, um, just adjusting that dose alone, whether or not any one of those strategies was better predictive of the development of amenorrhea. Um, although they did find that that Lupron, I know the thing we just talked about briefly in the last, um, last presentation, um, was very, very effective at, at causing amenorrhea. So that's something that is really needed for the patient. Um, and then some folks have been found to bleed even despite trying all sorts of different therapies. So my, our hope I'd say for majority of folks, we can get them to a place of amenorrhea with medication, but that's not gonna be everybody. And then one more, sorry, even tinier grid of options. I apologize, folks. Um, this this uh, it's really quite comprehensive chart is actually from the American Journal of, of OB-GYN in 2020, and it goes over contraceptive considerations across the transmasculine spectrum. So it did look at a number of different criteria that were potentially meaningful for folks on the transmasculine spectrum, including the ability of the contraceptive to reduce or cease bleeding, um, which is, I highlighted up here, and then um, the ability uh, of the, or the risk, sorry, the risk for continued um, spotting, which can be really troublesome for folks who, when they're just not expecting it, because it can cause so much dysphoria. Um, what they really found is that some of these therapies up top, 
So our oral contraceptive, that's a combination of estrogen and progesterone, the progesterone only pill, the patch and the, the ring, um, were actually probably the best at reducing bleeding and had a, only a very low risk for spotting. That's compared to the Nexplanon, the Mirena IUD and the Depo, which were all effective at reducing bleeding but had a higher risk for spotting. So I think it is of course up to the patient. A lot of folks are not gonna wanna take a daily pill that has a small amount of estrogen and progesterone in it um, or progesterone alone in it. Uh, so I do talk a lot about IUDs. I talk a lot about Nexplanon. But I do talk about that there's a slightly higher risk for the potential for spotting with those formulations. All right, second case. Um, so again, we're going to talk about the case briefly and then go into a breakout room. Um, so this is case two, um, Jay. Jay is a 48-year-old trans male patient on injectable testosterone every two weeks for the last six years. So he's completed probably his second puberty, which lasts about five years. He's considering stopping testosterone because he's worried about his health. He says his dysphoria improved significantly after he had a masculine chest surgery and feels like he's gotten what he wants from hormone therapy at this point. He says he's been donating blood regularly to counter the polycythemia that he developed on testosterone. He also says he saw a dentist recently who told him his blood pressure was too high. So he wonders about, you know, if he were to stay on it, are there some ways to limit the health impacts of testosterone as well? So again, the questions would be, what else might be helpful to know about Jay? And then what are his options um, in terms of talking about hormone therapy and just the limitations um, of that, some of those health effects? So we're gonna put you back into these little breakout rooms and come back in two minutes. everybody. Hopefully. Okay. Looks like we've got most people in here. Um, awesome. So uh, again, I would love to hear if anyone had some or any groups had some thoughts on what we might want to ask Jay, talk about with Jay, kind of suggest in this scenario. I know it's a big, big thing to throw out there. And the chat works great as well. Our group talked a little bit about like maybe the high blood pressure from something completely unrelated to the testosterone. Um, so maybe just treating the high blood pressure and then also like exploring with Jay, what are the like benefits that he's gotten from the mm -hmm. testosterone? And then thinking about like what would we would expect to be like durable after stopping the testosterone versus what might uh, go back to the way things were before starting testosterone. Amazing. I love it. That is exactly a conversation I would want you to have. Um, I am seeing in the chat to rule out sleep apnea. Fantastic. Yes. Think about your other reasons for having polycythemia um, and hypertension, which OSA is one of those causes. Yes. If it also stops testosterone. Yes. If it's within the patient's goals, I tell them up front, if there's ever a time at which you want to stop your hormone therapy, well within your rights to do so, would love to know so that we can help guide you. Um, but it is always an option for folks if they want to stop hormone therapy to do so. Um, and then I'm seeing possibly Q1 week injections or daily testosterone gel, right? Reduce the risk of polycythemia. Correct. Yeah. Dil Dylan and Becca. I'm presuming this is just Becca, but um, <laughs> Dr. Dr. Stevens, I think this, that is entirely correct as well. That is going to decrease the risk for polycythemia. Um, and if there are, oh, gosh, I can't say it very well, but if <laughs> epilerinone is not something that I typically use for folks or talk about with folks in this context, um, but could be something you could explore more kind of if we're talking about these other things and it, we're not getting good re resolution. Um, so, awesome. So options for Jay, who again is our 48-year-old trans male patient on injectable testosterone, who's gone through his second puberty and is wondering about stopping therapy because of concerns for his health. So yeah, we talked about stopping testosterone, always an option. Um, you know, if that's within somebody's goals, uh, you do want to talk about the risks a little bit more if somebody does not have another way to produce sex hormones. So somebody, for example, um, assigned male at birth who is now status post orchiectomy, doesn't have any way to produce endogenous hormone therapy and wants to stop estrogen therapy and not beyond testosterone, you do want to talk about some of those risks of not having sex hormone. Um, but it is always an option for folks. They are in control of whether or not they want to be on hormones in their life at this time. 
Um, and I've had a number of people stop and start and stop and start. So just a discussion of that being an option, but would want to be involved if possible. Um, and then to address polycythemia, there are a number of things that have been shown to reduce that risk for polycythemia. Um, so as uh, Becca spoke about, um, the switching to testosterone gel, um, gel is actually less likely to produce that polycythemia, so that could be one option for him. Um, you could also reduce from every two-week dosing of the testosterone injections, every one-week dosing of the testosterone injections. Uh, for some reason, we found that not having like the high higher peak, <laughs> lower trough of the testosterone for folks who are on every two week dosing, kind of at one week, you're gonna get less of a peak and a little bit less of a trough. So for not having as much of that variety has been found to reduce poly the risk for polycythemia. Um, and then it can, there is the option to just continue current injections. And then there are folks who just continue to do phlebotomy, regular blood draws to control polycythemia. Probably not the ideal unless somebody is really, um, really interested in doing blood donation for other reasons, um, but it is something that some folks end up doing just to stay on their testosterone at a dose that works for them. So lots of things to think about there. Um, I would also say ruling out other causes of polycythemia in this patient, depending on the level and risk like OSA is a really good option talking about smoking cessation, for example, as well. Um, it's not something where I typically will rule out polycythemia vera unless somebody's, if we can't get their, their hematocrit levels consistently below 50 per 2%, despite some of these other measures. Um, and they, they kind of have that risk for polycythemia vera, but it is something that you, know, you can think about as well. Um, and then the other thing to, to think about is, is just reassuring him that testosterone is safe and effective, normalizing that hypertension is a common disorder and just being able to treat it and that we can treat it well. Um, and while testosterone might increase that risk, it's not probably the only contributing factor. Um, and the final thing would be exploring whether he's feeling pressure to stop his hormone therapy. There's a lot of scariness in the world, um, especially being somebody who's trans, um, especially right now. And so just exploring kind of if that pressure is coming or where that pressure might be coming from, um, where that choice might be coming from, and it might not be external. There's also a lot of internalized transphobia that our, our folks who are gender diverse um, experience. And so just having more of an understanding conversation can be helpful. So just briefly, there are some risks of testosterone therapy. Generally, it's considered quite safe and effective. I put a list of some of them on here, um, which do include polycythemia, changes in cholesterol, changes in blood pressure, changes in weight and sleep risk, OSA risk. Um, Generally, in terms of the risks of testosterone therapy for cardiovascular disease, um, so this little table is from the Advancing Excellence in Transgender Health Conference um, from October 2022. And overall, they found that while testosterone may increase risk um, for heart disease to that which is more consistent with cis men in the family or in the, the blood relatives, um, really they've, they've found that mostly it just, it increases risk factors without actually increasing risk for cardiovascular disease, morbidity, or mortality. So um, there was a study by Gorin et al. in 2008 um, that showed this in 876 trans male patients on testosterone. And then um, the Asherman study also really well done, smaller cohort of uh, 365 trans men, but followed for 18 years, which is a really long time of medical follow-up. They found that there was no difference in overall or cause specific mortality. And you would do want to consider when you're looking at studies of trans testosterone therapy um, for gender affirmation, that there is also a large impact of just minority stress and the social determinants of health, in addition to the effects of the hormone therapy itself. And so a lot of if you're comparing patients themselves, I think that that's a really good measure. But if you're comparing patients to cis men, um, you know, I, I think that there is going to be a difference there just because of the, the stress that folks experience um, because of gender diversity. And then in terms of other risks for polycythemia, so erythrocytosis does occur in, in a large percentage of folks um, prescribed testosterone therapy who are assigned female at birth. Um, and that may, you know, when we think about polycythemia and the risk, there may be this increased risk for, um, for VTE, but the evidence is, is really quite weak. Um, and, and really a lot of the findings have showed that, that that erythrocytosis associated with testosterone therapy and folks assigned female at birth 
is not actually going to increase the risk for things like VTE, um, especially in comparison to how many people develop that erythrocytosis. Uh, so we really don't have any conclusive evidence to the effect that this is, is going to cause harm to folks, even if it is present. So we, we want to ideally, you know, I'd say when folks get to that 52% range um, for their hematocrit, I want to talk about ways to decrease that. Um, so we're limiting that potential risk. But um, in general, we haven't found that that risk is something going, that causes significant harm. Awesome. All right. Oh, um, I see some things in the chat. A, yeah, a couple <laughs> questions in the chat. I'll let you, let you read them. Okay. Um, and are there some questions about the durable effects of testosterone after stopping therapy, like which masculine changes um, endure and which may wane? Awesome question. Um, so there are the permanent effects of testosterone do include um, hair development. So if folks have developed new hair follicles on the face, chest, or other parts of the body, the hair does not go away. Those follicles do not go away um, over time, though the hair can get thinner over time. Um, the voice changes as well. If folks have developed um, a deeper change in their voice, that is also not a change that will go away when folks stop testosterone therapy. Um, and the clitoral development that occurs on testosterone therapy as well. Folks will notice clitoral enlargement and that as well is not something that will go away. Uh, people, however, are going to notice more thinning of their hair, a change again back in terms of subcutaneous tissue change. Um, fat might move more from the thighs and the hips back towards the abdomen, so a change in how pants fit, shirts fit. Um, so those would be, and then hair change, smell change, emotional change in terms of how people experience hormones and feel hormone therapy. Um, would be the things that you might expect to shift over time. And just stopping testosterone therapy after being on it for a long time. Uh, it's a big shift in hormones. So sometimes people experience that um, for some number of months, usually about three to six in terms of their body shifting back and kind of feeling that hormonal change, almost like a menopause or a hypogonadal change. Uh, change in their, in their body um, where they might feel changes in mood and energy and sleep and um, and hair and skin and kind of all of that as well for the time that their body is kicking back into the other hormone drive. Um, that's a great question. And is there a correlation between polycythemia and total T levels? So do you expect polycythemia even if T level is around 300 versus 900 or 700 to 900? That's a great question. Um, so I... I see, so it is um, related to testosterone levels. We found that higher testosterone levels are more correlated with polycythemia. And so one of the typical responses they found is that, that providers will just lower testosterone levels. Um, I've, you know, I, I'd say we generally aim, if somebody is, is identifies as male, wants to be on cis male levels of testosterone, we aim for the cis male levels, which is usually somewhere between 300 and 800. Um, and Within that, I'd say that even if folks feel better at the 700 level, I generally want to keep them there. It's, it's okay. It's safe to be there. Um, yes, it is an option to just lower the dose, but I often will explore with them if there are other some of these other options that they want to explore, um, like going from every two-week dosing to every one-week dosing to see if we can get the polycythemia under control with being able to keep them at a testosterone level that feels healthy for their body. So that's a great question too. Okay, I think that's all the questions. Um, all right, <laughs> so case three, so this is DK. DK is a 31-year-old trans male patient on an injectable testosterone um, for the past 12 years, so quite a long time. Um, over the years, he's developed more pain with his injections, which is leading to missed doses of the testosterone. He has a friend in Europe who's using a long-acting testosterone injection every three months and wonders if this is an option for him and, and what he should know about it. And so, Again, question is kind of what else might be helpful to know about DK and what are his options? Um, thinking about, again, this trans male patient who's been on testosterone for a very long time um, and wants to learn a little bit more about longer acting formulations or something that just might decrease his pain. So we'll break out again and I'll see you in a few minutes. All right, and I put a brief summary of the case in the chat just to reference. Thank you. Love it. Seeing faces. This is good. Wonderful. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I am curious as to folks' thoughts. So this is, again, DK, our young trans male patient who's been on testosterone for over 10 years. 
wants to talk about some long acting options, wants to talk about ways to decrease pain. Um, anyone come up with some suggestions for him? Um, none of us really knew about the long acting, so we're excited to learn about that. Um, but we talked about kind of um, other ways of testosterone delivery, so the gel or the patch, or even thinking about subcutaneous injections, which obviously is a smaller needle and tends to be less painful. Awesome. Thank you. Yes, I love that. Um, gel is definitely an option. What I found in folks on long term who've been on just tea is now just part of their life. They've had the changes. They just kind of it's a, an annoying extra med they have to use. Um, they don't really love using gel, going back to using gel every day, but it is definitely something I offer them. Um, in terms of subcutaneous, awesome idea. Um, yes, it's a smaller needle. Yes, it's evidence based um, and to be as effective as intramuscular injection for testosterone. We have less data in estrogen. Um, so that is also a great option for this patient if it's more about the pain he's experienced and the timing. Um, but I will move on, talk about options. So, so DK. Um, so there are actually quite a few options for him. Um, as we were saying, but the subcutaneous injections um, are definitely a good option. It's just instead of a one to 1 1.5 inch needle that's between 22 and 23 gauge, so kind of a chunky needle to be injecting yourself with um, in the thighs or the buttock muscle every one to two weeks, the subcutaneous needle is only 5 eighths inch and it's 25 gauge, so uh, much smaller. Testosterone is kind of a thick liquid, so getting it through that tiny needle can be a little bit challenging, but most folks find their way um, and find that for, for them it can be less painful, although there's still a risk for developing scar tissue under the skin with using sub-Q. Um, the long acting options are also great. So there's there's three of them I think about, um, or sorry, two of them I think about. Um, testosterone pellets, also called Testapel, are a really great option. We're going to go over a little bit more about that. The testosterone undecanoate, which is that long acting option, um, there are some extra risks with it. So we're going to want to talk about that. Um, and then finally, there's a Zyostead injector. Um, that is not a long acting option. It, it lasts still just one to two weeks, depending on the person's preference of timing. Um, but it's an auto injector. So in folks who are getting a lot of needle phobia, just don't want to do injections themselves um, is kind of an auto injector pen that makes it a little easier for folks to use. So just, you know all this, but the difference between intramuscular and subcutaneous injections, the intramuscular ones go in the buttock or the thigh, a little bit of a larger needle. You don't want to hit your sciatic nerve, um, but usually we'll have folks come in, work with a nurse for the first injection to do that teaching, at least the first one, um, so they can learn how to do it safely and effectively. Subcutaneous ones, there's a whole, there's a few different sites that folks can use, and you do use that smaller needle, which is nice, and it's just as effective. And then, these other options, so Testapel, um, these are these self-dissolving pellets that last every, you re repeat them every three to four months. Um, and they go under the tissue of the kind of the upper buttock area. Um, they're placed in clinic. There's not that many Testapel providers across the country, unfortunately, but we are lucky in that our UW Men's Clinic actually has a provider who does Testapel. And so it is something that um, we frequently use at Fenway uh, in folks who were just on long, you know, had been on T for a really long time. Um, they found this much easier to use in their life. They didn't have to do injections or pills or anything um, on a regular basis. They could just come into the clinic every three to four months to get these replaced. And then they self dissolve. You don't have to take out the old ones, put in new ones. They, they dissolve really slowly over three to four months. Um, you kind of do a little nick, uh, numb up the area with some lidocaine, place the pellets, and then put a little steri strip over. So it's a, a pretty simple day procedure that folks do. Um, you do have to justify doing the referral to Testapel um, in terms of having difficulty with adherence and kind of not being able to use the gel or just not being a good option for folks in um, in terms of, op uh, of other options, um, but this really works quite well for a lot of folks who, are, and if anyone's interested, you can do that referral for them. Um, the long acting injectable, this testosterone and undecanoate, much more common in Europe than here. Um, it's administered every 10 weeks. In the US, um, because of the risk, even though it's rare for pulmonary oral micro microembolism or anaphylaxis, this is only administered in the office. So. I think the challenge there is having somebody come into the office every 10 weeks um, to get an injection. And then, you know, the, the risk for 
pulmonary oral microembolism is kind of a scary risk to have for folks. And, and so if that's, I don't know, I do have that conversation. I haven't had many people take me up on this injection because of that. And then the auto injector, just a, a quick photo of it <laughs> comparatively. Um, it kind of is that pen auto injector we see for a lot of medications these days, which makes it a little bit easier for folks to use. Cool. All right. Oh, wait, two chat questions. Um, oh, Testapel. Neat. Oh, yes. Thank you. I think it's really neat. It works really well. Um, <laughs> Awesome. So case four, um, this is Sam. Sam is a 50 year old masculine leaning patient on testosterone therapy for the last two years. He's coming to the office because he has symptoms of dysuria, frequency and urgency. And his UDIP in the office does confirm he has a UTI. And this is his fourth UTI this year. Um, he is sexually active with his boyfriend who's a cis male um, who has had a vasectomy, they're monogamous. Um, he's tested negative for STDs on prior tests and doesn't have any change in vaginal discharge, you know, no nausea, vomiting, or fevers. Um, so pretty much unlikely he's got things like pilo at this point. Unlikely he has an STD at this point, though possible always. Um, and unlikely he's pregnant. Um, and then his job has made him return to in-office work this year. And he says he really just tends to hold it at work um, because he doesn't always know which bathroom to use and doesn't always feel safe using the restroom. So talking more to Sam, kind of what else might be helpful to know? Um, and then what options might you offer this 50-year-old uh, this 50-year-old masculine leaning person who's been on testosterone therapy for about two years and has been coming in with some recurrent UTIs? So we're gonna do a breakout session and then come back. Wonderful typing skills again, Lindsay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> very, very impressive. Hopefully not too many errors. <laughs> oh, it's great. It's great. Um, so timing wise, I mean, we're, we're flexible. So we, we're going to have a house staff meeting from like 1045 to 1130 or 1145, but um, uh, Ken isn't able to make it. So we are yeah. flexible. Um, okay. uh, mostly, you know, whatever your time constraints are. And then... Okay. Um, but I think otherwise folks were planning to, to be here. So okay. Um, it's okay to extend a little bit more. Javel, does that sound reasonable? Okay. Yeah. I'm sure as residents, they want to <laughs> do a few minutes of their own thing. Um, but I, I have like the rest of this case and I had one more, I wasn't, I wasn't actually planning to go through the informed consent after that. Cause that's probably another like 15 minutes. So I was going to stop after that kid, we finished case five, but it'd be great mm -hmm. to get through case five if that's an option. I think, think that sounds great. I think that'll be yeah. perfect. Um, and then um, what we could do is if you have a, a document that's like the informed consent, I could send it out to the mm. residents to um, review more on their um, own time, if that um, sounds good. We could, or... we could do that. I would also, I'm also happy to like, I have to make the slides into a PDF version, but I'm happy to, oh. to share them with folks too. Um, okay. And so that they they have that available to them. Um, I I found in my practice, and I, I talk with folks about this on the elective, is I actually have kind of notes for myself to when I'm going through the full informed consent. I've had other providers at Fenway who would literally make a PowerPoint and go through it with patients to go through the informed consent. So it can be really helpful to have it break in, broken down in the way that I do in the PowerPoint, um, even though I, I I give the patient the informed consent sheet to have at home. Um, I don't use the same one that UW uses, so that's my only hesitancy. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Okay. Well, um, yeah, we can we can um, touch base after the the next case. I think folks are coming back. Yep, they'll yes, be back yes. in one second. Welcome, welcome. Love this. Woohoo! everybody's wonderful faces. Um, welcome back, everyone. Thanks for, for chatting about Sam. Um, I would love to hear what groups came up with in terms of what they might want to know um, or explore with, with him. And the chat works as well. Oh, nothing. We answered all questions with the prompt. Um, all right. I know it's getting late. Okay, I will jump in.
with my suggestions. Um, so, so for Sam, um, I think there's a couple of things to think about. Um, you know, of course, we treat his UTI today, but I think there's there's probably some more to it. Um, one thing to think about is that uh, frontal hole atrophy, and you can refer to that area of the body in many ways. I usually will ask patients how they refer to it and mimic their language, um, whether or not it's vagina, frontal hole, or another um, another uh, language or another description that they prefer to use. Um, but a lot of folks do develop atrophy. It's really, really common um, for many folks. They start to develop it within six months of starting testosterone therapy, and it does tend to get worse. So by two years, they've developed quite a, quite a bit of it. And so just talking about ways to counter that, given that it can be a risk factor for increased UTIs. Um, is, so that's just a common thing that we want to be able to address and discuss with patients. And some people have no discomfort with it, no issues, but others might. And so something we wanted to talk about. Um, of course, regular things we talk about with anybody with a vagina or a frontal hole, use of lubrication, urine, urinating after intercourse can be helpful to decrease the risk for UTIs. Um, increasing hydration can as well. I think it's really challenging in folks who have to go out in the world and feel a lot of fear somewhat legitimately around using restrooms and having a safe place to urinate. Um, so having that conversation with him around um, ways he can hydrate and urinate safely. Discussing stand to pee devices, which if it feels more comfortable for him to use um, a binary male labeled restroom, um, being able to stand and, and use the restroom or use the urinal can feel more comfortable. And so um, for some folks, they wanna be able to learn how to use a stand to pee device and to be able to use it um, use it when they go to the restroom. And so that's something we should be discussing with him. And then just thinking about safety and, and how we can navigate this. Is there a way at work um, that HR can help? Um, are there other ways that you know we could have more inclusive environments? And I will say that includes in my practice at the VA, so much work to do um, so that people feel comfortable. So generally just managing frontal hole atrophy. Um, of course, we talk about this with anybody who develops atrophy. Um, there's, there's pills, there's gels, there's a ring. Um, and so these are all things that could be used intravaginally to help decrease atrophy um, and which can cause discomfort, increase risk for UTIs, and can actually lead to some insufficient PAPs as well. So I've had folks on testosterone therapy who just keep getting insufficient PAPs um, with the atrophy they've developed on T. And so sometimes using a, a vaginal estrogen prior to the PAP actually can be helpful as well. Um, it's, some, it's helpful to reassure folks that this is not gonna in, interfere with the testosterone effects, um, but can help in terms of um, helping the tissue in that specific area and helping their urinary um, either continence or, uh, or urinary uh, risk for urinary tract infections. Um, one thing to note about all these different therapies is that they can potentially weaken condoms, diaphragms, and cervical caps. So you don't wanna use them within 72 hours after a dose of vaginal estrogen. All right, and then stand to pee devices. Um, what is a stand to pee device? It's a device that usually looks like a penis, although um, not always these ones. Um, so folks, there are a variety of different options. Um, and it allows people to urinate while they're standing. Uh, usually you wanna replace them every 12 to 24 months because they can wear out. Um, they can be washed with soap and water, sterilized in boiling water. Um, so relatively easy to clean um, regularly. And, and it does take practice to use. I do tell people usually, you know, when you're practicing, use it in the shower. Try using it in the shower. That is a safe place to use it and practice at home. You'll want to practice at home even out of the shower until you feel more comfortable using it out of the house um, so that you're not ending up with accidents. So they still can happen. Um, and so this is something that you do really want to practice using. Some folks wear it using more of a harness to keep it in place and other folks um, wear it just with more briefs that can hold things in place. And then you do want to make sure patients know you do want something that has a hole, has a flap so that they can actually um, access the urinal using their STP device when they go um, into public and need to urinate. Generally, um, folks who um, are assigned female at birth on testosterone have a significantly higher risk for UTIs because of this holding it phenomenon, because they're not able to access safe restrooms regularly. And so they tend to underhydrate um, and they tend to um, not, not pee as often. And so it is really something you should be talking about with their patients, um, seeing if it's something they've developed. And then I'm just looking at the chat here as well. 
Um, wonder about atrophy and whether topical vaginal estrogen might be an option for him if he's interested in it. Love that, yes. Or prostheses for the bathroom. Love that, yes. All the things we just talked about. Um, I and then I'm here, Becca. I don't think this of this is something. Uh, we should be counseling folks on who are starting testosterone therapy. Is this something that you talked about with people preemptively? And it is something, it's part of um, when I go through the informed consent with folks, um, I talk about it as one of the things that they are going to experience. Um, and then for some folks, that's something really concerning for them um, because it's a huge part of their sexual functioning or pleasure or just a concern because they don't want discomfort. And for other folks, it's something that they don't want to talk about now and might not ever want to talk about but it does open up the conversation and I find that it brings out a lot more questions um, and makes people hopefully, hopefully again, this is me in a position where I'm talking to people about it, say, feel more comfortable bringing it up to me later if or when they do experience it. All right, case five. So we've got one more case um, and then I think we get, we will wrap up after. Um, so case five, this is June. Um, June is a 25 year old assigned female at birth primary care patient who comes in to discuss options to affirm June as an agender person. Um, June wonders about microdosing, which June has read about online. And June would like some clitoral growth um, and asks about applying testosterone directly to June's genitalia to get growth without other changes. Um, June is also, at the end of the visit, brings up having some trouble taking a deep breath. And you talk to June further and um, find out that uh, June has been using ACE bandages to bind June's chest. Um, so with that in mind, um, what would be some helpful information to know about June? And then what are some options that you might be able to discuss with June? And June is an agent or person who uses June's name as, as their pronouns um, rather than other pronouns, which is why I'm using them here. So we're gonna break out and come back together in two minutes. Hello, hello, welcome back. Awesome. So thank you all for meeting and talking about June, um, who again is our 25 year old agender person who's interested in options for testosterone therapy, um, particularly to address clitoral growth and also experience some dysphoria around their chest tissue. Um, so I'm curious what folks came up with as to thoughts of things that might help or just questions that they might have. We talked a little bit about asking June about their binding practices and um, talking about <clears throat> kind of safer binding practices, um, as well as whether June would want, um, you know, would be interested in um, other ways of chest reduction like surgery. Awesome. I love that. That is hugely important. So I appreciate you talking about that. Cool. All right. Oh, thinking about June. Um, so what are some options that we can offer? So um, microdosing, we're gonna talk about a little bit. So essentially low dosing of testosterone um, is an option, something I talk about frequently. Um, does need to be tailored to the patient, the person in front of you in terms of what their goals are. And so really exploring that is helpful. Um, and coming up with the person in front of you, kind of the plan on how to use things and then the plan on should we need to adjust things going forward, um, how to initiate that as well. Um, folks often can also try something like a limited course of testosterone, rather say, we want to try it for a year, see how you feel. You can always stop it um, and see if you can get some of the effects you're looking for, like the clitoral development, without some of this, without going to the place of having some of the other effects. Always a challenge. Um, I will say that, you know, with testosterone therapy, um, any level of testosterone, I'm going to do the full informed consent. I'm going to talk to them about here's the expected changes in somebody on cis male levels of testosterone. Here's the timeline of those changes. Here's what's permanent. Here's what's not permanent. Um, but here's the risks. Here's the formulations. And so I go through the whole thing with every patient um, so that they know these are the potentials and we're making a decision together. Um, 
What we know about uh, compounded testosterone for genital application is that it absorbs systemically. Um, and I think they've done studies in folks who were born um, with micro penises and then they were given testosterone therapy and, and they tried doing testosterone therapy directly to the genitals to see if that would help. And they're like, eh, it doesn't really help any more than anything else because you're really just absorbing it systemically, um, just like you would with other forms of testosterone gel. The other thing to know is if somebody really wants to apply it to the genitals, you do need to compound it in something like Vaseline rather than um, in the alcohol-based um, base that we use for other forms of testosterone gel because you just don't want to apply alcohol to that area of your body. So you have to work with a compounding pharmacy uh, to prescribe this for the patient. And then it is an out-of-pocket um, cost. It's not something that is uh, covered by insurance. So that's something to, to know when we're talking about um, clitoral growth and development. It's just whatever testosterone you're using, it is gonna cause clitoral development, doesn't necessarily have to be applied directly to the clitoris for that to happen. Um, and then in terms of other options for June, um, we can talk about hormone suppression alone. So that is with medications like Clupron, um, again, bringing that up as well, um, which is a GnRH agonist. So it works on the pituitary hypothalamic um, adrenal access um, or gonadal access. Um, however, I'd say that if we're using a suppressor of hormones alone, of sex hormones alone, um, it is something where we typically want to use it for a short period of time, just because the long-term effects of not having any sex hormone in the body can be dangerous for things like bone health. So typically we want to say, eh, we can try this, see how you feel on it. But um, really, we don't want to limit, have that duration go on and on. Let's kind of set a limited time data for when, we're, how long we're going to try it for. Um, June is also somebody where, you know, I, I wonder if it's more the feeling of having something in that area of their body it doesn't necessarily have to be growth of their own clitoris. And so something like a packer could be an option. So think about the STD device, something that looks like a penis um, and feels like genitalia that they can wear, um, but isn't something necessarily that they have to be able to, to urinate through. And so for some folks that can feel very affirming as well. Um, and then in terms of their chest, uh, oh, Oh, goodness, go back. Um, thinking about whether or not something like a binder might be helpful and more safe than, some, than ACE bandages or those chest surgeries like um, Dr. Feist was talking about. So, so, you know, microdosing, what is it? We talked a little bit, but using low dose or really limited doses of hormone therapy to affirm someone's gender. It's important to discuss the goals as well as the realistic expectations. I can't tell them they're not going to have hair growth or potential scalp hair recession, um, even on low doses of testosterone. So we really want to talk about the full gamut of what could potentially happen with being on testosterone therapy, but also give them the idea that if there is something happening that they don't like, they can always stop or reduce the dose and come back around and talk about what's going on and, and ways that we might be able to change things. Usually I recommend starting low, monitoring closely, um, pretty close follow-up for these folks just to make sure that what is happening with their body feels good, feels affirming. And then remind them that they can stop whenever the medication is no longer affirming or desired for them. And then in terms of gender affirming prosthetics, um, and binders. So binders are kind of tight fitting things across the chest that give the contour of a flatter chest. Um, so it's kind of an undergarment that can be worn. Um, in terms of safety, it's really important that folks be able to take a deep breath when they're wearing their binder. So something you really just wanna be able to tell folks and talk about um, that they should be able to take that deep breath. It shouldn't be tight enough to the point that they can't breathe. Um, it's also important to avoid things like ACE bandages, plastic wrap or tape, all of which I have seen. Um, it can actually cause damage. It can cause risk for increased risk for pneumonia. Um, so just wanting to talk to them about safer options, um, even if that's trans tape, which is gonna be safer than some other types of tapes out there. Um, and ideally something more like a binder that can be fit uh, to their body and used safely is important. Um, it's a, important to use a size guide to really find the right fit for the binder for the person. And then it's also important to take a, a break um, really so every six to 12 hours just to take the binder off, take some deep breaths, um, have a, a break for your rib cage, and then to not sleep in the binder as well. Um, I'm just seeing no other questions I'm seeing here. 
All right. So just a summary of the cases we discussed today. Um, we talked about management of genital bleeding in somebody on testosterone in terms of adjusting dosing of testosterone or um, using contraception for menstrual suppression, not just for contraception alone. We talked about polycythemia and ways that we might change formulation or frequency of dosing to decrease that risk. Um, we talked about difficulty with adherence to injections due to pain and other options, including the Testapel or the Zyoset or subcutaneous injections. Um, we talked about recurrent UTIs, use of STP devices, and discussions of vaginal atrophy, and then what we can offer to folks who identify as non-binary or agender um, or might be interested in microdosing. So I have a whole informed consent discussion, but I think today that was so much information for you all. Um, I do want to plug that we have a wonderful elective for folks who are interested in learning more about gender diversity and gender diverse patients, which includes coming to the VA and, and joining uh, me in our gender diversity clinic, as well as going to multiple other sites. Um, so if anyone is interested, please let, I think, Lindsay know, <laughs> um, and we'd be happy to, we'd be happy to work with you. Um, also feel free to reach out with any questions to myself too. Um, I'm happy to, to answer them. Eh, I'll put my email in here. Which yeah, is just I'll just <laughs> give another shout out for um, the um, the trans health, uh, non-binary health um, uh, elective, um, which I did. Uh, I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, but um, get to work with wonderful folks like Dr. Campbell and Dr. Wright um, and uh, just Im improve um you know, your understanding and, and confidence of care for, um, for these patients. And, um, uh, you know, uh, especially right now more than ever, um, uh, that we can provide our, our care and support for. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm just, I know I'm like going through to the end and I just also wanted to, I think bringing it all together. There's so many ways we can affirm people, Hormone therapy is just one of them. Just making sure to be comprehensive when you're talking to folks. Talk about things like voice therapy and hair removal and prosthetics and surgery options and just kind of the full spectrum of things um, that we can offer. Uh, not all of them can be prescribed, but it's important to have those conversations regardless. Um, and I really appreciate you all being here and being advocates for, for the wonderful gender diverse people we get to work with. So thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. And um, our the house staff meeting with Ken is uh, rescheduled to next week. Um, and uh, until then, I hope you all have a wonderful um, Memorial Day weekend. Enjoy some of the sunshine. Um, and we'll we'll catch you next week. <laughs>